days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away. sing this little light of mine y'all put your put your light up with me here just put it up we're going to let the light the candle light that's your that's your candle let that candle light shine here we go this little light of mine i'm gonna let it shine oh this little light of mine i'm gonna let it shine this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Don't let Satan get out, I'm gonna let it shine, oh, don't let Satan get out, I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm gonna let it shine, oh, let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Amen. Hey, y'all did good. <laughs> That's the way to live successfully. How do I know the Bible tells me so? Do good to your enemies, and the blessed Lord you'll surely please. How do I know the Bible tells me so? Don't worry about tomorrow, just be real good today. The Lord is right beside you, He'll guide you all the way. Have faith, hope, and charity, that's the way to live successfully. How do I know the Bible tells me so? Thy Word. Is 
a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, think I've lost my way, still you're there right beside me. And nothing will I fear as long as you are here. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I want to just take a second here. The Word of God is absolute, and it is absolutely necessary that we lean on it. You know where I learned that? There was this guy in my life. <laughs> he, was, he was either pop, if I was feeling honorary, or he was dad. <laughs> When I was real young, he was daddy. And he got into a school for his high school that taught him that the Word of God was God's infallible plan for man. And he went out and he searched for a church when he got back from the service that would fulfill that. And I wound up in Cincinnati Avenue Christian Church. And I'm really thankful that I grew up in that, in that church. But it was Dad's influence that did that. And he continuously, continuously said, if you don't find it in the Word, you need to shut up. <laughs> if you don't find it in the Word of God then you've got a little choice. You can do it or not do it. But if you see it in the book, yes or no, that's the answer. That's what Father's Day means to me. And that's just my little quick testimony. But he influenced my life in a great way. He also did some things that were really important, like spending time with me, coaching my ball team. You have to understand, Dad had never played ball in his life. He didn't even know how to hold the bat when he started. But they didn't have anybody that would coach the team in our whole area there. And he said, finally, he said, so my son can play and quit bugging me, I'll do it. And he studied it. And I knew he cared about me because he had a stack of books by his chair that he was reading on how to coach and how to play baseball. So, fathers, God bless you. We're glad you're here. And we're... We're wanting you to feel honored as God's special people today, just as we made the mothers, I believe, feel that way just a short time ago. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never runs out, never runs out on me. Your love. And it's higher than the mountains that I face. It's stronger than the power of the grave. It's constant in the pile and the change. This one thing remains. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never runs out, never gives up on me. Your love. I want us to sing one verse of the family of God, if we could now. I'm 
so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood, joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. You will notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and these folk are so near. When one has a heartache, we all share their tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood, joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Amen. Thank you all up here. Appreciate your good work. I want to offer a word of congratulations to two families here. One is the pianist who's making her way back to her seat. They are celebrating 51 and then seated back here where her mother makes her behave in church is a lady who's celebrating 50. Just did. Those are marks that not a lot of folk reach in this day and age. Praise God that some are doing it. It's an encouragement. We're in a series on uh, the home in many ways, and we're approaching that from uh, different angles. And we've got a few more lessons to learn, and I've been cutting from these things, and I'm going to probably stretch this another week or two, but uh, here, here we have today an important thing about the home, and I'm going to apply it right at the end to the church, and it's just thinking about the need, the need for support, and uh, let's take a moment to pray, and then we're going to enter into a study of this. Father, we're grateful to You for the opportunity to share together. Help us to know what You want of us regarding our lives, Your church. We are so thankful for the church. We're thankful, Father, for marriage and what it does. And we just ask You to bless us. Work with us. Help us to see more and more each day your will for our lives in this area. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever believed that your parents or your spouse didn't want you to be a real person? There are people that carry those feelings around. There are kids who carry those feelings around. Does anyone criticize you when you're doing your best? Have you ever talk, been talked about instead of being talked with? Have you ever been the last one picked for a team sport? Have you ever been ridiculed for your clothing or appearance not being what other people thought it should be? Do you worry about what everyone's going to wear to the party? Has someone manipulated and used you for their own ends? Have you lost in the game of love? Has there been a time when you experienced physical violence? Did you ever feel no one would love you if you didn't perform in a prescribed way? Have you ever been snubbed? Do you get overlooked 
for a pat on the back. How about the loss of a parent or a spouse to death? Have you experienced that? That's a form of desertion that affects us very much. These and many other areas are instruments where we feel rejected. Sometimes we can feel absolutely worthless when we're having to deal with one of these things. You know, it's one of those, I wish I'd never been born kind of moments. We can feel inferior. And sometimes, just because we're in those kind of spots, we can't express our feelings. We become depressed, withdrawn, paranoid. We become perfectionists or slobs out of these things. We feel self-condemnation. -condem we have worries, doubts, guilts, and fears growing from many forms of rejection. We must, we must improve. Whether the rejection is real or imagined, we must deal with it and handle it. Have you experienced the old story, the Lone Ranger and Tonto? They rode up to the top of a hill and looked down ahead of them and the Lone Ranger said, Tonto, Indians everywhere down there. Mm. And they turned their horses and they looked and coming up behind them, the same thing. He said, there's Indians that way too. Let's check the sides. And they looked to both sides and there were Indians surrounding them. And the Lone Ranger said, what are we going to do? He, Tano just turned his horse and rode off and said, what do you mean we, white man? <laughs> Somehow, I feel like we run through that kind of thing at times. We wonder just how well supported we are and who might be deserting us. This goes on all the time in life. And more than once, people have lost sleep over that kind of thing. Now, the Bible has a perspective on this that gives us an answer. And you don't usually think of it as being the answer, but it is. It's very well documented in the book of Acts. There was a guy named Joseph. Now, we know him by another name because the apostles called him Barnabas. And we learn about him when the church was very young. Joseph, surnamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field belonging to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. That's Acts, the fourth chapter. Later on, this guy becomes a missionary. There were many effective proclaimers of the word in the day. But you know what? In the Bible, there is only one Barnabas. And it is at his recommendation that the church finally let Saul, who had gone through that conversion experience on the road to Damascus, finally let Saul come to church. Because they were scared to death of him because he had been persecuting the church. Barnabas is described in the scriptures in Acts 11 as a good man and full of the Holy Spirit. That has a lot to do with his success and his being Mr. Encouragement. Encouragement was the thing that in, endeared him to the people of the church of that day. There was a young man in the church named John Mark. John Mark went out on a trip with Barnabas and Paul. And he got out and he got homesick and he wanted to go home to Mama. And he did. When they got ready to go on another trip, John Mark said, I'm ready to go this time. I'm ready to do it. Let me go, guys. And Paul said, no way. No way. And Barnabas contended with him, saying there should be a way. We should encourage him. We should take him with us. And they split up and went two different directions to cover the same journey that they were to go on in preaching the gospel. This is a man of encouragement. This is Barnabas. It's amazing that he would stand up to Saul since he was such a nice guy, but he felt it needed to be done for sake of John Mark. You ever hear of the book of Mark in the Bible? You know, it's right back there by Matthew. Hmm. 
That came because John Mark was Mark and gave us that gospel. God wants to have a place in our lives. And encouragement is what helps us have that. God wants to have a place in our homes. And the existence of encouragement is what makes it more than bearable in that home. Because encouragement is love. And we all want a lot of that. A vital part of the Christian life is encouragement. Encouragement. God wants us to have that as support for our lives. And wants us to use that, just as Barnabas did in the church, in our homes as we live day to day. God has provided then support systems for us. Ways for us to succeed. Way for, ways for us to not be put down, knocked down, trampled underfoot. Have you ever heard of Spitz work? Now, I'm not talking about Mark Spitz, who swam so fast. I'm talking about Dr. Spitz, who ran a research not too long after the end of the Second World War. They had a lot of orphan children, babies, and they had to be cared for. And so they created orphanages in Europe. And they put these babies in those, and then they started having a problem. In some of those homes, up to 50% of the babies were dying in a very short space of time. 50%. In most of the other homes, it was almost 100% still healthy, still going. So they went and studied each of the homes, compiled their thinking, and here's what they came up with. We are going to have every baby held and cuddled while they're fed. Because the homes that were doing that were having their kids live. And the ones that just threw them into a crib, propped up the bottle and left them, were not having that success. They'd been in a traumatic time, and that filters down to babies. I know you don't think it does necessarily, but it does. You, you, you get some noise and some bad action going in your home. That baby knows it. <laughs> And they will fuss and carry on until they get the attention they want. So they went out and they found a whole bunch of grandmotherly types who would come in and feed those babies and cuddle them and play with them, you know, the gitchy gitchy goo kind of stuff. And guess what? Most of them survived at that point. Why? Because they had a support system. They had love and warmth and attention. Now, with a kid, you've got to give them that. Because if you don't, they'll pull into a shell. Or they'll raise cane. Or they'll do alternately one and then the other. It's just the way it works. We need support. We need it as adults as well. We're going to take a look at the family for just a minute and see about the support that we need. Uh, some people get support from friends and teachers, co-workers, and you even get support in a negative sense from your enemies. You know, sometimes I felt real good about myself because of the enemies that I had made. Because I was doing it in the name of Jesus and they were standing up for anything that was evil. And that was, that was a positive. Even though it was in the negative. Parents, first of all, provide such support in the home. If we look in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, the fourth verse, it says, Fathers, oh, that's addressed to those of honor today. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. We do all kinds of interesting things to kids just because we don't think it through. Sometimes we get perfectionistic. Now, I wasn't a perfect child. Yeah, fortunately, my parents aren't here to testify that that's true, because <laughs> they could. But my parents didn't get perfectionistic with me. 
They expected me to give my best. And if they thought I wasn't, they would talk with me about it. Real seriously sometimes. Kids, kids need time with their parents holding them up, not time with them holding up an impossible standard. And if we become perfectionistic with children, if we expect too much, we must expect something. But if we expect too much, we can hurt them. I had a lady in counseling once. She came in. She was having a terrible time in her marriage. She was having a terrible time in her work life. Everything was just upside down for her. And so I asked her, I said, well, where did you start first getting the feelings that you were not as good as other people? And she just dropped her jaw. She said, how did you know I felt like that? I said, just from conversing with you here a little bit. I got it. What was it that made you feel unsuccessful? She said, it was my mother. My mother. She came to me and she said, you should be on the B honor roll. You need to make the B honor roll. She did that and stayed after me for two years. Finally, I decided to really work at it and made the B honor roll. This woman was smart as a whip. I want you to know that. She could have been an A student. And as soon as she made the B honor roll, that's what her mother told her. You should have made the A honor roll. We have to accept kids doing as best they can at the time they are in. And due to each circumstance, you will find them doing a little better or a little worse. It's just the way they are. Don't provoke them to anger. In other words, don't make your kids mad by impossible things that you expect from them. They need to be handled with loving discipline. That gives them security. They need to be taught. There was a teacher that told her class this. She said, did you know that with a single stroke of the brush, Joshua Reynolds, the famous artist, could change a smiling face into a frowning one? And one little boy yelled out, yeah, so can my mom. She uses a hairbrush. <laughs> Children need discipline, and spanking is a good way to handle it. Not beatings, but spankings. They need to be told what they need to do to be under control. And then, in love, they need to be disciplined. And they need to be disciplined with an explanation of what's going on and why, very carefully. And then, if you're determined that spanking is appropriate, and it is in the Bible, if you're determined to use spanking, spank them until they cry. I had kids I could just look at and they'd cry <laughs> because they knew what was coming. But let them cry. You can hug them while they're crying after the discipline is taken care of. Give them love after they get that discipline. But do give them the, the, the discipline. It's necessary. Another thing that's important is that somewhere in your lives, home devotions come up. If nothing else, pray at the table every time you eat. That's a good place to start. Then it's good to have discussions. You can't do that every day. I promise you. You go in, you eat, and then there's this program to go to at school, and that program to go where there's a ball game, and, you know, it gets that way for parents. And it gets difficult, and you feel like you're, uh, like a picture of a dog chasing its tail, you know? It's just frantic. But every time you have a chance, spend a little time talking about God's will for their lives. You don't have to pull the book out. Just know it enough to give them a little of it. Give them a little of it. Talk with them about how God wills this for our lives. This makes a major difference. When my father backed up his ability to spank, <laughs> his ability to talk and share, and when he brought the Word of God into it, 
he influenced my life. This is what is needed. We need some form of home devotions, even if they are short and not just Bible reading, but Bible principles. That's what we're supposed to be getting to the kids. Let's support our kids and express love. That way they'll know acceptance. They can have discipline and they'll know that we love them. I had one of mine, I gave him a, I have three boys and one girl. I gave him a, a spanking and then he was standing there looking at me and I said, now again, you know why I did that? Because you love me. He at least had gotten that message through. And that's important. We had adoptive children being prepared for adoption in our home when I was back down in Oklahoma and had a little boy. And I asked him that question. Do you know why you got spanked? He said, yes, I was bad. <laughs> What did you do that was bad? He named it. I said, okay, if you stop doing that, then you're not bad, are you? No, he said. Okay. We need to get the idea. Teach children that when they are forgiven, they're restored 100% to relationship. Give them support. Give them help. I had a teenage girl come in to talk with me one time. And this is how interesting it is. Am I too strict as a parent? That might be a question you ask. I don't want to be too strict, you know. This little girl came in. She's early teens. She said, I have a problem. I said, okay, what is it? She said, I don't think my parents love me. I said, well, tell me. Why you think that? She said, well, it's just that all of my friends have curfews and they'll let me stay out as late as I want. And she didn't feel that they were protecting her as it turned out. Get the idea. A certain amount of strictness and definitely standing by the rules. First this set, and then whatever you need for the household to function. Stand by the rules. They'll be blessed by it. They'll be blessed. I want to touch on marriage for just a little bit. When we get married, we hope someone will support us. Now, I'm not talking about money. <laughs> I mean, that's a good idea too. But they'll support us. That they'll care for us. Ephesians 5, verse 33, which is underneath my marker. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife even as himself. Even as himself. And let the wife see to it she respect her husband. That's what is needed in the home. Respect for the man is support. And it's a place where he'll feel loved. If he's always put down, he will not be a source of safety for the home. He needs to be encouraged and respected. Ladies need love. They want to feel loved. If they feel loved, they can go through a whole lot and successfully carry on life. But there's having that love that helps make things work for them. It's vital. First Peter 3 has that in it, that there needs to be love and support. It's vital that everything is okay with our mate. It needs to stay that way. Whatever we have to do, we need to be doing it. That way they don't feel like they're out there on a hillside watching the Indians attack from every direction. They feel supported. So Tarzan came home and said, Jane, get me a triple bourbon. She said, Tarzan, I'm worried about you. 
every afternoon you come home from work and you're, 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 you're getting sloshed almost every day. He said, Jane, I can't help it. It's a jungle out there. Literally, <laughs> it is a jungle out there. There are difficulties. There are things that, that hurt us. There are things that we need help with. We need to be able to communicate with our spouse. It's most important. Don't just go away going, hmm. Come back and talk. And talk meaningfully with them. We have a course that we've offered several times, and I'll offer it to those of you who might want to try it. It's called Christian Marriage Enrichment. If you have a good marriage, we can help you make it better. We can honestly do that. And if we can get uh, three or four people in it, not people, three or four couples. You have to come with a spouse because we spend a lot of time just working through and talking through things. But would be interested in, in doing that. I'm just throwing that. There's got to be an ad in here somewhere, you know. <laughs> but I think that, that that could be very helpful. You know what causes our difficulty in marriage? We expect to be supported. And sometimes we don't get it. We marry an ideal, not a real person. You know, we have a fantasy of what a mate should be, and love becomes blind out of that. And we don't see faults because we idealize the person that's showing us some attention, and we forget. We forget that well, they've got their best foot forward and they have another foot. We've got to deal in that. Uh, I insist on premarital counseling. We need to touch someone else's life. I believe in courtship, we ought to have young people spend a lot of time just sitting at a table across from each other. Why? Because when we touch, we go to the feely end of it, and we don't work through a lot of things that we ought to work through. So if you have kids dating, encourage them to talk with the person. Say, you can come in, you can sit on that side of the table, you can sit on that side of the table, and you guys can talk for the next two hours. Good chance they won't. <laughs> but if they do, they'll be blessed by it. I want to cover church real quickly. The devil wants to interfere in the church. He wants to keep the church from being supportive. The church must be supportive. What Satan wants to do is undermine the roles of people in the church. They want to attack preacher, primarily, elders, teachers, secondarily. The further up front anybody is, the more he wants to undermine them in their roles. Now, we play many roles in life. I've been a son, a father, a husband, a minister. That's just a short list quickly. Satan wants to undermine and take away our confidence to fulfill what we should be doing in those things. He wants to take away our support. I had a man in... Bartlesville, Oklahoma, I'll name the church. He was after me continually to do certain things that I was not likely to do. I thought that they were things that hindered the church rather than helped the church. But he just rode me and rode me, and he would do it in board meetings, he would do it anywhere along the way. And it was hard to lead that church until one day he got mad and left. And it was like they opened the doors and turned the lights on in the place. And people flocked in. We cannot be satanic in our thinking and unforgiving in our attitude. We need desperately, desperately to be supportive of everything that's going on. Sometimes it may need a tweaking. But talk tweaking. <laughs> Don't talk throwing out. 
Don't say everything's gone wrong. Everything's bad. Sometimes church fights take place because we don't think in terms of the church being about support. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Right? That's what we are. We're to be a family, not one that's completely bereft of love and care, but the kind of family that God wants to be created. How do we identify people as followers of Jesus? Well, by how well we can form committees and get a job done. No. By the size of the church. Thank God. No. By this, you will know. And all men will know that you are My disciples, Jesus said. What? If you have love, one for the other. This is what we need. This is the way we know that we are disciples. This is the way we know we are succeeding. We are giving love. We are not plotting, cussing, hurting, dealing anger. No. What we are doing is by the Holy Spirit putting aside the deeds of the flesh. Galatians 5 says the deeds of the flesh are evidence and list them. And it has everything to do with relational problems in that passage. And then it comes down to it. This is where it is for us people. This is where we get support in the church and support in the home. And I'm only going to cover it once and I'm going to cover it quickly because you should get it. He says, don't do those bad things. And then in the latter part of the fifth chapter, he goes into the 22nd verse. And he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. And he adds, against such things there is no law. That's when a church is successful. That's when a marriage is successful. That's when child rearing is successful. When the Holy Spirit controls us. If you're having problems, the first thing you ought to do is say, God, I'm having problems. The second thing you ought to say is, God, I'm not quite sure what to do with these, but I ask you to fill me with your Spirit so it can become clear to me what I need to do to help this relationship with a child, with a spouse, with somebody at church. Because God will provide the things we need to do to do it. The church isn't about checking up on people. There is an accountability, but it's a loving accountability. That's what we try to emphasize in our discipleship group. We try to realize that we have a responsibility to one another to encourage, to lift up, to be a blessing. And as we do that, as we do that, the church becomes what God wants it to be. We need, we need the filling of the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. You know how hard it is to be filled with the Spirit? Say, God, fill me with your Spirit. Jesus said, you know, you just have to ask God and He'll do it. And then expect the Spirit to prompt you a little bit more than He has been. And He's going to give you the things that you need to do to be successful in relationships. Relationships are vital. They are vital. We must forgive and move toward relationship when we're hurt. We must move toward relationship continually in our lives. This is why God sent someone named Jesus to this earth. To bring us into relationship with Him and with one another. There's a need for support. And without support, let's face it, you can get mentally ill. Life can become extremely difficult. 
we need, we need as Christians to hang on to the Christ and ask for His Holy Spirit to direct our lives. Keep that prayer in your mind. He'll make you aware of what you need to do. It'll start coming, oh, you won't like some of it. You'll go, I don't want to do that. I hate to give in on that. I, but that's what we need, is God intervening in our lives to make relationship work. We'll take up more of this as we go along. But it's good for us to evaluate our relationships and walk closer to the Christ and walk through life with a filling of the Holy Spirit blessing us. We're going to offer an invitation. If you want to make a decision, this is the time you can come forward and do that. Those of you who are online, uh, we're glad you're online. We'd love to have you come in. But if you want to make a decision, use the phone numbers that are available. We will respond to those. Let's join in singing an invitation song. If we could get the song put up, please. There we go. decision this isn't the only time to make one when you want to make it let us know we'll help you with it right now we're going to partake of the the Lord's Supper this song expresses what it's all about listen to the words as you're singing them and then Harold's going to lead us in prayer
Lord, we thank you for this day you have given us to come here and worship you. And Lord, this is a special day for fathers. And Lord, as much as fathers love their children, you love us more, Lord. Lord, we pray for this merger as it, with this church from Metropolitan Metro Church of Christ, Lord. We ask that everything we do here would be in accordance with your will and for your glory, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would heal those who are in need of your healing touch. Be with those who are traveling this weekend, Lord. Give them a safe journey back to their homes. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us where we fail thee. Guide and direct us in your Son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now we take the Lord's Supper, the bread representing his broken body. And the cup, an appeal to God for his blood to cover our sins and for us to have a covenant with our God. Okay, you're set for, the, the ladies' study is going to probably, a week from Tuesday, have uh, a gathering. There were too many of them out for, for this one. Be in prayer for those who are dealing with surgeries. Uh, Jared, who sits right back there, uh, is not here today because he tried to do something that was too big for him. I didn't know anything was. He's strong. But he put his back out. He's got to get it back in before he goes. So he's laying on ice and a hot pad and ice and a hot pad until he can go to work on Monday. Uh, keep him in your prayers. I want to say again, Happy Father's Day to all the fathers and uh, just pray God's blessing upon you as you lead in the life of your family. You know, that goes on. We had, we had a gathering yesterday. It was kids, grandkids, great-grandkids. And uh, it, it, was, it was wonderful to do that. It, it felt really good. Besides that, they fed me really great. And, but uh, we, we, en we enjoyed that very much. Uh, reach out and honor fathers. Reach out and be a blessing in the life of somebody who needs help, who's fathering. God will bless you for that. And we're going to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer now. Father, Father's Day above all else is about you being the Father of all mankind. And we come to you asking you to bless us, help us, lead us in paths we should walk. Above all, help us to consider you and what you want done in every situation. We pray in the name of Jesus our Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. I've got a long, long way to journey. My life is not my own. I've got a lot of places I must go before God calls me home. I've got to go tell it on the mountain. I've got to go tell in the street. I've got to go, go, go tell everybody. My Jesus is so sweet. 